Wait, you've got to be kidding me. Let's get this untwisted. Welcome back to the Twisty Pod. This is your host, Taylor Woods. It's so lovely to have you all back. I've never done this before. I've never just kind of sat down and started recording. Normally, I think of a topic in my head. Maybe I'll post it on Instagram. Maybe I will just kind of generate a few ideas, maybe do an outline. But right now, I actually just sat down after doing an incredibly hard ab workout, which I suppose I can recommend if you're in the interest of hurting your abs, those poor things. But I didn't even finish the ab workout because I think I was either just done, it's 4 p.m., I'm kind of just, eh, I already went on a run, or it was really just that hard. It was actually sent to me by a listener and subscriber. Her name is Paige. She is awesome. And it essentially kind of stems back from the last episode, which if you haven't listened to it yet already, my interview with Janet Domahina, actually that's two episodes ago. Sorry, getting my scheduling confused. But that episode was so beyond fun in so many ways. And one of the coolest things I learned about Janet that I did not know before going into the podcast, other than just she's an absolutely incredibly fabulous human being, is that she happened to cheer for the same cheer company that I've idolized for so much of my life and it's called Cheer Athletics. So learning this or if you listen to the podcast, you might have quite literally heard my jaw fall onto the floor. It was absolutely crazy, drool everywhere. I was so amazed, admiring her in the moment and still do. I just felt like I was talking to an idol or something. But after I shared that and I posted the episode and whatnot, Paige reached out to me and she sent me over this workout from Cheer Athletics that she says is really darn hard, but you know, a really good workout to incorporate into your routine. And it's this ladder workout specifically for your abs, for your core. And whenever I hear ladder workout, I immediately think, oh, easy. You know, you do two reps of something, you do four reps of something, everybody, you know, you can do two reps, like whatever. But then you go all the way up to however many, and then you go all the way back down. And I always forget about the all the way back down. But this time, I didn't even do the way back down. I just stopped. I stopped at the top. I walked my way out on the top. And here we are recording the podcast. I quite literally just finished my last 12th rep. And here we are. I've been doing a lot of redecorating lately. And it's one of those things that I wonder what took me so long to recognize how poorly decorated my apartment is. I truly think the actual walls and architecture and design of the unit Keith and I live in for even making my apartment look good because truly the things that we've added are just not cool enough, I guess you could say. Most of this apartment was hand-me-downs, hand-me-downs, if you know, you know, from either Keith and I's siblings or from our parents, whether that was a dresser, a table, a stand, so much of it was either from them or from our college dorm rooms. So redecorating a space any size is an expensive, exhausting project. And sometimes, you know, you have to do it bit by bit because it is pricey. You don't just want to drop a whole bunch of money on the apartment when you could go drop it on Uber Eats. You know what I'm saying? So (laughs) that's actually the most unrealistic approach of them all. We're being honest here. But it's taken me almost... I guess over a year and a half of living here to finally be like, wait a minute, we have this ginormous open wall over our couch and it's never been properly filled. And I've always been almost too cheap to invest in anything for the ginormous wall because when you have a wall of this size, and truly I would say it has to be at least, I don't know, like 10 to 12 feet long or 10 to 12 feet high of just blank wall. If you watch my videos, you've probably seen it. And during the holidays, I will often put up a few Christmas wreaths because they're pretty to look at, but that lasts for what, like six, seven weeks most? So I finally decided, you know what, I need to make my space my own because when you are not comfortable in your own space, especially when I've spent the last almost year now quarantined in the same little hobbit hole, I just, you know, you get tired of looking at the blankness of things or the lack of good design, I suppose, like my terrible interior design habits just flaunting themselves. So I just kind of decided 
I need to finally decorate that darn wall. But then once you kind of get inspired by one thing, you don't want to stop, you know? You just want to do a few more things. Or, I mean, even on my bed, I've never had proper adult pillows. Back home, I used to have like six pillows of the exact same size because they were all those like weird ones from childhood, like coffee is love, coffee is life, something weird and cheesy I probably had as a teenager just like little cute pillows but you know when you see those big like uh, mature adult beds they always have these proper pillows on them and they're decorated so nicely I really wanted that I needed that in my life so I finally just said why the heck have I not bought a darn pillow so I bought pillows now I'm buying paintings now I put up a mirror I put up a clock I'm finally starting to live in an apartment That is decorated. (laughs) And I think the hardest part is truly trying to do it on a budget because I truly am. I would say my best friends have been, even Etsy, shopping through small businesses is a really great way to support them. And also they have some of the absolute coolest prints, the coolest designs, or even if it's just a mirror or a clock, something really simple to brighten your space. I've loved looking at Etsy. Target is also a really easy option, especially if you can go and pick up the orders yourself. You don't have to worry about delivery fees. I got a really, really cool painting for $20, I think. And then mirrors are always so crazy expensive and I don't actually understand why it's a round piece of glass it's probably 18 inches why does it cost a hundred dollars everywhere I found one for maybe thirty dollars and it's real it's not one of those cheap flimsy glasses that makes you look like you're in a fun house so that made me so beyond happy but I just want to emphasize the point of creating a vibe in your space and feeling so proud to call that space your home, especially if you're like me and you're quarantined and you're staring at the same darn blank wall and you've been staring at it for months and you keep telling yourself you're going to do it. Maybe don't order from Starbucks a few times this week. Maybe don't eat out at your favorite restaurant. Save that extra $20 or something and buy your favorite painting from your local Etsy shop, your local Target and brighten up your space. Do something that's going to kind of change the energy because you're probably as tired of your space as I was of mine. I even saw a few videos on TikTok last week of these girls trying to put their beds in their double doored closets, which I would don't even have a closet that would be able to do something like that even back home. But it definitely feels relatable that we're at that point in quarantine. Gosh, how are we even here? But that point where you just want to completely have a new look, you're tired of staring at the same thing, you need something different, you want to change up your space, and I'm here to encourage it because it's made me pretty darn happy. And that's my fun little segue into the mental health aspect of what I really want to cover on today's episode. I've been extraordinarily grateful and gracious that I've had the opportunity to speak on a few different podcasts this week from really, really awesome creators. The first is a podcast by Amanda Wan, and she hosts the Behind the Girl Boss podcast. And that was a really awesome episode. We kind of covered a whole bunch of different topics from the podcast to YouTube to fitness, but then it kind of ended up not really expectedly taking a turn and talking a lot about mental health. And then even just hours ago, I recorded an episode for the So Confused podcast with Morena, and she talked a lot, a lot about mental health. And it was the most enlightening conversation because that was truly our goal of the podcast. We wanted to have a conversation about your approach to fitness in regards to mental health and making sure that you're still taking care of yourself and taking care of how you approach your fitness journey with your mental health in mind. And it was one of those things where you know, you sit in your own thoughts, obviously all day long. And sometimes, you know, you get so used to either just hearing your own voice, hearing your same thoughts that can just drone on and on. At least I've been realizing I'm a big rambler lately, but you know, you just, you only sometimes listen to your own perspective. And obviously your perspective is only limited by what you've experienced in your own life. So speaking with somebody who just had a different outlook on things, or maybe just helped you realize more things than you hadn't thought about ever before was so cool and enlightening and it just kind of motivated me to almost continually talk about how important your mental health is or continue the conversation of speaking with other people about their mental health experiences or maybe how you can help others or create a positive space for people to 
be kind to themselves, be kind to their bodies because we're able to hear so many different people speak on a subject that is so beyond important. I think something that is not spoken about enough in the fitness industry particularly is prioritizing your mental health in every aspect of your journey. I think especially with Instagram, I think, or you know, whether it's TikTok, it's YouTube, on any media platform, it's often taught to have a fitness journey. You need to be productive every single day. You need to be active. You need to be moving your butt. And if you miss a workout, then you're falling behind. You're not meeting your goals. And I think I for so long even believed that myself because that's almost what I was taught. I was taught to think that if you don't work out every single day, then of course you're not going to reach your goals because you're not working towards them. But you cannot work towards your goals if your goals do not include prioritizing your mental health. And there are days when all my mind, all my body, my mental health is telling me to do is absolutely nothing. Maybe it's hard to get out of bed. Maybe it's hard to even put on workout clothes or it's hard to even convince yourself to do the bare minimum. And I want to emphasize the fact that prioritizing that and taking that time for yourself or maybe even if you need to seek out professional medical help in that respect is of the utmost importance and that is not a bad thing whatsoever. I want to destigmatize the idea that you have to be doing something every single day to be reaching your goals because if you're not prioritizing your mental health I don't even I don't even know what it is to say. It's like that has to be the top priority. And mental health in some ways I think has sort of become like this topic that I think companies will capitalize on or maybe even it's um what's the term for it? Like a buzzword almost that people want to use to say, "Oh, I prioritize mental health with my audience, my platform, my company, their mission, their practices." But if that's not being actualized, if you don't see that actually carried out in any of their practices, any of the things that they promote, any of the things that they sell, the way that they treat their employees, their customers, it's not worth it. Like you can see through the flaws of the argument that they're just trying to maybe get you to follow along or to buy their product because they want you to think that they're relatable. They're understanding what you're saying. It's mental health, blah, blah, blah. We care. But I encourage you to almost be thoughtful and critical of those people that maybe you follow, maybe you look up to, whether it's a company, it's an influencer, it's a YouTuber, a creator, friends in your life even. How are they living to those truths that they maybe speak about? Are their actions compatible with their words? I sort of went off on like a deep tangent there for a moment, but I just want to truly remember and continually be mindful of the fact that mental health is not something to be taken lightly. It's something that is very serious. It's something that we continually need to almost remind ourselves to be careful of and to be thoughtful of every single day of our lives. Just like, you know, you wake up every morning and maybe you do your skincare or you brush your teeth or you turn on music or you start the news. Just like that, maybe you need to take one extra step to add into your routine that is giving yourself affirmations, whether that's out loud or it's in a journal, or maybe you take time to journal, or maybe you take time to read, or you start your day off with a little morning walk, or maybe you just sit in bed and kind of sit with your thoughts for a second because that's what your mental health is calling you to do in that moment. This was something I really talked about with Morena a lot too, was that in America, it's often taught to constantly feel like you need to be productive at all times. And I definitely dove into this on my own podcast in the episode about productivity culture and why it became so beyond toxic for me and my mental health and how there were so many months or even years of my life where I was constantly battling my priorities almost, or I was just doing too many things that I was putting my friends on the back burner. I was putting Keith on the back burner. I wasn't doing even what Taylor wanted to do because I was constantly moving from one activity to the next because that's what I had to do to be successful or that's what I had to do to add to my resume. I had to be in all these clubs. I had to be in charge of all these things and I I never could sit at home and be alone in my dorm room because that would mean I wasn't socializing. That would mean I wasn't adding more things to my list of to-do lists because I just want to be busy, busy, busy all the time, meetings, meetings, meetings. Even in the workforce, it kind of feels like 
if you just go to work and you just come home, you know, where's your other things? Is that all you're doing with your life? Is that all you're doing with your time? It's like this terrible stigma. And I felt that to my core. That was the exact reason I started my YouTube channel was because I had this crazy identity crisis after I graduated where I was so lost. I didn't know what the heck was happening anymore because for so long I was so busy and tied into this idea of being productive that almost I had put up these blinders to my own mental health that I was completely neglecting. And I almost fought my problems by continually being busy. I would just continually keep moving from one thing to the next to keep my mind busy so that I wouldn't have to face the dark thoughts in my mind when I was alone or when I wasn't doing anything. But all those years of fighting that or avoiding all of those feelings, all of that sadness, I guess you could even say, caught up to me the minute I graduated and the minute I finally hit the gas pedal. Oh my gosh, I mean the brakes. <laughs> the minute I finally hit the brakes after I graduated and my life went from 100 to zero and all of a sudden it was just me on my own and I was going to work, I was coming home and it felt like this isn't enough. When truly that is so much, that is more than enough and I should be taking that extra time in my day after work, after I'd get home to be with my family, to be with Keith, to enjoy, I don't know, cooking dinner or just taking a bath because it's what I needed for myself that day or just being lazy, watching Netflix. But I was so conditioned to believe the exact opposite for so, so long. And, you know, I'm kind of, I guess you could say grateful in some ways that I had that sort of post-college life crisis because it led me to starting a YouTube channel. It obviously led me to also starting this podcast eventually. So I'm grateful right now for the place that I'm in, but I wish it hadn't have been in that respect almost. I'm like sour to admit that it was because I had not prioritized my health for years that it brought me almost to a dark, dark point in my life that finally, finally motivated me to do something for myself, which was following my passion and starting my channel. And that's kind of a very advantageous way of prioritizing your mental health by doing a very not relaxing activity of starting a YouTube channel. But I think on a much broader front, that shouldn't be how it is at all. It should be doing the things that maybe you're just called to do. Sorry, I just snapped my water bottle. For your mind, for your mental health sake, and that doesn't have to be anything. It could literally be nothing. But I just want to continually emphasize that being productive, constantly being on the move, or especially in the fitness industry, the fitness realm, constantly having to work out, constantly feeling like you need to be active to move every single day. I mean, I could even be guilty of that myself by starting the Step Into 21 Challenge and encouraging you to do little things every single day. Maybe it's even hard for you to wake up in the morning. Maybe it's hard for you to even get out of bed and work on yourself or to even just find the strength to get up and move. I just want you to know that above all else, I am here to be your friend. I'm here to be your supporter, your encourager, and to meet you wherever you are at. And that doesn't have to be in regards to fitness in any sense of the term. I mean, I sort of feel like I got myself into a very unique position in kind of this space that I'm in where I post fitness content a lot. I post a lot of wealth lifestyle content, but I'm no expert myself. I really don't know what I'm doing and I never want it to be solely fitness based. I want above all else to just have you every single time you tune into the podcast, every single time you watch a video to just feel like we are friends and maybe you need 10 minutes out of your day to kind of escape to somewhere else and to laugh at my weird dance moves and to laugh at my weird workouts. Maybe that's your form of self-care for the day or maybe you just need a friend in your life and you need somebody to direct message on Instagram. That's what I'm here to do and that's the most rewarding part of the position that I'm in, that I'm able to connect with people like you and to talk with you and to actually know you. I don't ever want to be one of those people that needs to tell you to wake up super early in the morning and that if you don't do that, then you're not going to be successful and you're not going to thrive. And if you don't do this, you don't do that. It's not going to work for you because 
one size does not fit all. One mold does not fit all. One program does not fit all. That is something I always talk about is that there's so many different workout programs for a reason because everybody's so different. And that is especially important with your mental health because doing what is important for you and your happiness looks different for every single person. So for example, it can be seen as a good thing to constantly be productive and active, but there are some days when your self-image is just so terrible, it's hard to do all those things that are constantly being promoted to you online. And I think that's kind of the exact basis of why I wanted to record this episode is to emphasize that there is literally nothing wrong with that. And I've mentioned this, I think, on a podcast before because it rings a bell in my mind, but I think something that is hard to remember, especially when you follow maybe a few different fitness influencers and you see them on your feed, maybe like I do, it's hard to remember that those people are posting their workouts for their job. It is their job to create content. It is their job to post content. A lot of times that content is filmed maybe all in one day. They spread it out over a week or two weeks time but it can feel like they're posting a workout video every single day of the week. And then you feel like poop because you're laying in bed and you just do not have the motivation to get up or you just don't feel good about yourself that day. And then you go through your phone, you go through your feed and you see all these people that have had these incredible fitness journeys or they have all of these things that we desire and we just poke at ourselves and we poke at our insecurities. And it can be very, very hurtful and damaging to look at that day after day But I just, you know, as like a background tip, always just want to have you remember that that is what they do for a living. So posting that workout content does not mean that every single day they are doing that as well. Everybody has a story that we do not get to see. Everybody has their own insecurities. Everybody has their own internal battles that they fight every single day. And it's so easy to not remember that when all we see is the highlight reel, the perfection on Instagram. And it's so easy to sit there and compare yourself and to feel down on yourself because you haven't moved all day long and you're seeing all of these people out and about or you know at the gym, et cetera, et cetera. It can feel very damaging to your mental health. That's just another good reminder of remembering what a highlight reel we live in in every sense of the word. I mean, you think about the most curated people even if you think about like the Kardashians for example their feeds are absolutely beautiful but of course that's not perfect of course that's not their actual life but how are we supposed to know any better if that's all we see all of the time I also just want to share more openly and more commonly on my channel or really in any platform that I take a lot of rest days myself and sometimes those rest days are going on a few walks or something or you know just kind of taking Reese around the block maybe maybe I'm just doing house chores and I just you know kind of count that movement for my workout but I would say most commonly at least three to four days out of the week my rest days are quite literally me sitting on my floor sitting on my couch sitting in my bed not motivated to do anything not motivated to get up or maybe I just have so much work to do it doesn't feel like there's time in the day And not only is that actually very good for your body to take full days where you're not moving, you are letting your muscles rest and your body recover from a workout or just from the day, what have you. But also my mental health could not take it if I was working out every single day of the week. And I don't choose to work out every single day of the week. One, because I don't think it's necessary. And two, I don't think it's safe or a good idea. And I think I kind of say this in a joke, but it is quite true. I very much battle, if I'm going to relate this back to the Enneagram, with my Enneagram because I have found through some more deep reflection that I'm actually an Enneagram 9 wing 1, which essentially means as a 9, I am pretty much inherently lazy. And not lazy in the sense where I'm just like this sloth that does nothing all day long, but I just love soaking in time and I love being able to just enjoy being lazy. Sometimes for me, that means sleeping in and getting up late and just having a really slow start to my day. I kind of need that. I almost need like extra hours implanted in my morning to have a really good, fresh start to the day or else I feel overwhelmed or else I feel 
stuck or just caught up in the mix of it all. But then there's this wing one side of me, which basically means that I kind of take on the attributes of an Enneagram one. And the Enneagram one is a perfectionist, which kind of means, you know, you prioritize your to-do list, you prioritize needing to get things done and doing them the right way. So you can imagine when I have this lazy side of me talking to the to-do list side of me and that internal conflict I have when I'm laying in bed for hours because I'm watching Love Island and I want to prioritize just being lazy and loving it and doing nothing. But then there's these constant thoughts in the back of my mind or really in the forefront of my mind that are yelling at me to get up or I'm not doing enough or I need to go be editing. I need to go work out. I need to film something. I need to do X, Y, and Z. But I wish I could just turn off that wing one for 10 minutes or a full freaking day if I'd have the opportunity to do so because I just I want to acknowledge and relish in that rest time I want to know that that was exactly what I needed for that day I needed a full season of Love Island to just indulge in and relish in and love and not get up and be productive and be active and work out just because that's what I've seen everybody else on my For You page, on my Instagram feed, do all day long. This question from Instagram says, how do you prioritize your mental health and well-being? Because I feel like I always overwork. I think that that's one of those one size does not fit all explanations. For me, I almost have to give myself mandatory days off, which kind of sounds silly and like a very forced way of telling myself to relax. But at least in the quote unquote career that I'm currently in right now, it can feel like anytime I pick up my phone, I feel an urge to answer an email. I think any person that has a business email on their phone can probably relate to that. But I feel an urge to do that. I feel an urge to go on Instagram and, you know, maybe post a story, post a feed post, message people or answer YouTube comments. Every time I pick up my phone, it feels like I could do more. And if I'm not doing that, then I'm not good enough. But there are so many reasons why, you know, being on social media can be such an unhealthy thing. And it's so hard to turn your phone off and to quite literally put it in a different room if you need to and put it away. But for me, in that respect, I just tell myself there are certain days of the week when you're not going to do absolutely anything. For me right now, it is Saturdays and Tuesdays and I just kind of do nothing. Maybe that means if I'm in the mood for it, I'll go work out. If I'm not in the mood for it, I basically like draw back the blinds. I'll sit on the couch in a whole bunch of covers. I'll binge watch a show. I'll eat pretty much whatever sounds good. I'll just kind of feed my soul, if that makes sense, which is a really cheesy thing to say. But those days are sometimes the highlight of my week because you need your weekends, you need your time off. And maybe when you're a student or even when you're in work, it can feel like you work all day long working for the weekend. But on the weekend, there are so many things that you want to do because you didn't have enough time for them during the week that the weekends feel like errands or you're doing chores when the week feels like you're just so tired from work that you don't have any energy. And there just needs to be even if it's a mandatory carved out time to do fill in the blank. For me, it's sitting on the couch watching TV. For maybe somebody else, it can be something a little bit more stereotypically self-care-esque, like a face mask, a bubble bath, reading a book, going for a walk, listening to a podcast. But on even a broader sense, I would also encourage you to be very thoughtful about the things in your life and what you're doing and how they either help better you or how you are being improved by those activities. For example, when I was in college, I was very heavily overly involved and that's definitely a fault of my own, but it was almost something that felt instilled in the students by the university. They very much encourage you to be involved on campus and, you know, that can be a really, really good thing. But I remember even like I would have conversations with Keith and or people who didn't know Keith and they'd say, oh, like, what does your boyfriend do? And I'd say, well, he's a student. Like he wasn't really involved in any extracurricular activities. 
And people were like, huh, like that's kind of weird because, you know, if you didn't have four extra things to add on to your name, like, oh, Taylor Woods, she was involved in this and she was involved in this and involved in this, blah, 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 blah. Then you weren't doing enough. Or maybe it was weird. Like, gosh, it's such a sin to just be a student. Like, who knew it was such a crime? But being a student is hard. Like, that's hard work on its own. You never know somebody's situation. You never know somebody's full story. And maybe they just don't want to do it or they just can't. And that should never be a bad thing. But sometimes I think back to those times when I was so overly involved and I was doing far too much. And I wonder how many of those activities that I was involved in were really bettering me or were really challenging me maybe in a mentally stimulating way or even in a way that challenged my perspectives, challenged my outlook, things that I wish I would have known in that moment. And perhaps if I had been more self-aware, if I had been more interested in prioritizing my well-being and my mental health and taking those extra hours of the day for me, then perhaps I could have actually quit one of those organizations because I knew I needed to spend time on myself or maybe I just recognized that it wasn't bettering me in a way that I hoped that it would. And I think some people look at that as a weird thing or a bad thing that you'd step away from a club or a, a sports, an organization, a job, an internship. And of course, you have to be grateful for the opportunities. But if it's taking away from your well-being, then what is it adding to your life? Is it worth the subtraction of your mental health in order to just be a part of that club or organization? That's what I wish I would have asked myself two years ago. This is a really great question, and I don't know if I've ever talked too extensively about anxiety, but the question just says, how do you get over anxiety attacks? And I I don't know. I, I'm hesitant to speak on this too extensively just because I am no medical professional. I am not knowledgeable. I didn't study psychology or mental health, but just from an open, honest perspective, I think it's different every single time. And sometimes for me, I really just need to be alone. I need to kind of sit with myself and sit with my thoughts and almost like allow myself to be upset because I can get very, very, very overwhelmed um, to the point of like full body shakes, you know, and just feel so overtaken by the anxiety in the moment that I just have to be alone. And even Keith will, you know, try and nurture me or help me. And I just, no disrespect to him or anything, but you know, sometimes like you don't want to be touched. You don't want to be bothered. It makes it worse when people tell you to relax. And I just almost have to remove myself politely from whatever situation I'm in. And if that happens to be somewhere in public, you know, maybe I can hopefully do so in a respectful and polite manner. But anxiety attacks are the worst because they always come unexpectedly. They always suck. Like they just are the worst. I also take a lot of time to recover from anxiety attacks. I feel like the actual attack itself could be anywhere from a few minutes to an hour or so. But after that, I feel so emotionally exhausted that I end up doing pretty much nothing for the rest of the day, the rest of the night. So sometimes I kind of just end up maybe ignoring my feelings, which isn't the best thing. And, you know, scrolling through TikTok, scrolling through my phone when I probably shouldn't. But I don't think that there's any right way or any wrong way to deal with your own personal anxiety because nobody understands it like you do. And perhaps if you are interested or you've been diagnosed, then taking some sort of prescription medication could be a good route for you. Like I mentioned, that's not a recommendation. It's just something that I know a lot of people enjoy because it does help them immensely. I would highly, highly recommend doing your research on that though. But really, I don't have any one right way because there never is one anxiety attack that is just like the last. It's always different. It's always challenging. But being alone for me is kind of my go-to. I just need to take a moment and try and cope with my emotions on my own. A huge part of my mental health, or at least something that I think is very important, hopefully I've tried to repeatedly emphasize this with my platforms. When you're wanting to work out, do the workout that makes you happy. Do the workout that is going to make you feel so good and proud of yourself at its completion. 
because I spent so many years trying to do different programs that I saw my friends doing, I saw influencers promoting that I admired, I saw were kind of like the cheap, quick fix to lose X amount of weight, etc. And I was never kind to myself. I was never kind to my body. And I never looked to work out for its joy. I never looked to work out because of its benefits. And I wish I could tell my younger self to do that. I wish I could tell my younger self don't waste your time just trying to do something else to, I don't know, fit in or look a certain way, but rather do something because it's going to make you happy. Do something because it's something that will quite literally chemically release endorphins and give you a, a boost of happiness and make you feel so happy that you're prioritizing something that gave you joy. And that doesn't look the same for everybody. And, you know, I talk about maybe doing a certain workout challenge or I'll talk about my running journey. And that's just what I've enjoyed doing. But if you even watched my fitness journey video or I did a fitness journey podcast, I think it's maybe my second episode ever, I talked very extensively about how many different workouts or workout styles I've done my entire life, even from organized sport to weightlifting to hit workouts to running to walking to the latest guide or influencer workout to follow and for so long it was always tailor working out for other people it was always tailor working out to achieve a look for the approval of other people but it took me so long to be confident enough in myself to do a workout for the enjoyment of it I just said something in cursive <laughs> but I just wish that that was something that people talked about a little bit more is working out because you enjoy it or working out because you're able you because I mean for me I am so grateful for this powerful body that I live in and I'm so proud of myself that I've gotten to a place where I'm starting to learn to love and appreciate my body for what it is and I want to be able to fuel it right I want to be able to nourish it right I want to be able to feel happy when I'm doing a workout because this was what I chose to do for the day. And it wasn't this workout that I thought I should be doing because it seemed cool or it seemed right or I wanted to do it because it was going to get me this slim, unattainable, photoshopped body, but really because it was good for me and it brought me joy. And I am proud of myself for at least starting on that journey. And I hope that I can inspire you to Look for the joy in doing whatever it is that you are doing today. I think my voice is starting to go, which is kind of funny because I used to lose my voice all of the time and it was kind of one of those weird things I would achieve or I would want to achieve and be satisfied with. Like, I'm so cool. I lost my voice. <laughs> I can't talk. But then I'd get embarrassed when the teachers would call on me and I would not be able to say things. But then it would be like kind of quirky, I guess. Oh God, I can't believe I said that. Okay. Okay. But genuinely, I feel like my voice is going. So I need to probably go have some hot tea, soothe my voice. People always recommend honey with your hot water if you're losing your voice, like hot tea and honey or whatever. But maybe I am the only person in the world that doesn't like honey, but I truly do not like honey. I don't know what is wrong with me. It just, maybe it's the viscosity. Is that the right word? proven all of my teachers right with my good grades. (laughs) I kind of think it's the smell though and the sweetness. I do love maple syrup though. I mean, how could you not? 100% maple syrup in my morning cup of joe. No, I'm just kidding. That's kind of disgusting. Although I think I've tried that once. But yeah, maybe I'm just going to go have some maple syrup and hot water right now and lemon. Does that sound gross? A little bit. Love you all. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Here I am just sending you a little motivational message, motivational message for the rest of your day. What do I want to leave you with? If you're still listening, go leave a comment on my most recent Instagram post for the Twisty Pod telling me what was one thing that you did for yourself today that was kind. How are you kind to yourself today? Maybe the day's just getting started no excuses. You need to be kind to yourself all day long. Maybe it's just a thought. Maybe it's an activity. Maybe it's a self-care moment. Go tell me how you've been kind to yourself today. For me, I was kind to myself today because, okay, well, it's going to happen. I'm going to go take a bath. I'm going to go take a bath right now. I'm going to bring my maple syrup hot water with me. I'm going to light a candle. I'm going to read my book. I'm reading red, white, and royal blue. 
I think it's just about to get juicy. I'll let you know how it goes. I love you all so much. I'll talk to you in the next one.